I'm Ocean Robbins, co-host of the Food Revolution Summit, and I've got some good news for you about cancer. In fact, I think it's great news. A growing and convincing body of research tells us that many, many cases of cancer can be prevented. So what's the number one factor you need to focus on if you want to kick cancer to the curb? It's the food on your plate. With the Cancer Fighting Superfoods Guidebook, you'll find out what the studies actually tell us, and you'll get the latest anti-cancer breakthroughs, so you can take immediate action to protect yourself and the people that you love. When you enter your name and email right on this page, you'll get your free guidebook, and you'll also get free access to the 10th Annual 2021 Food Revolution Summit. My dad and colleague, best-selling author John Robbins and I are bringing you this summit because we're on a mission. We want to help as many people as possible stay healthy during the pandemic and beyond. During this free online global event, my dad will personally interview 25 of the most brilliant revolutionary experts as they share this year's breaking updates about food and health. You will leave the Food Revolution Summit inspired and empowered with trustworthy information that you can put to use right away. Just enter your name and email right on this page to join in the free summit and to get your free Cancer Fighting Superfoods Guidebook. The truth is, you are meant to thrive at every age and stage of life. No matter what happens in the world of pandemics and politics, this is the time right now to take charge of your health. All you've got to do to get it all for free is to enter your name and email now. And I'll see you in the summit. Let's do this. Hey everyone, this is Jenna Matecki from Plant Based News. That trailer that you just saw is for a free premiere summit linked below. The summit features 25 different experts in the fields of lifestyle medicine and conscious living. I actually had the honor of interviewing one of these experts, Dr. Christy Funk. Dr. Christy Funk is a breast cancer surgeon and so much of what she shared is truly life-saving information. If you get something out of this video, please forward it along to friends. And in the meantime, I really hope that you enjoy this interview with Dr. Christy Funk. Dr. Funk, could you please give a quick breast anatomy 101? So there are two main components to the breast tissue. Lobules, that's mostly the lumpy bumpy stuff that you feel when you touch your breast. The lobules make milk and then there are about a hundred teeny hair thin little ducts tubes that carry the milk from the lobule out and through the nipple. They all coalesce and only about eight to 12 emerge from the nipple. And then if you think of your breast like a big bunch of grapes and I'm holding the grapes by a single stem, this is the stem that comes out of the nipple. And then you've got all of these stems going back and back to all of the fruit, the grapes. The grapes are the lobules, all the stems are the ducts coming together together and then the one in that segment that comes out of the nipple. So then you've got about eight to 12 segments like that throughout the breast. The whole thing then is submerged, our great bunch, push it into a big thing, a jello. The jello is made up of fat and stroma and blood vessels. And there you have breast anatomy. Thank you very much. How about breast cancer 101? So the majority of breast cancer starts inside those little ducts or tubes, 75%. 15 to 20% starts in the lobules and five to 10% is weird stuff. What happens in any cancer in any organ of your body, but in our story, it'll be the milk ducts that we're talking about, the most common subtype of breast cancer. You're supposed to have a single cell lining around that duct where each cell looks pretty uniform and orderly one to the next. When something in life, which we can talk about those some things in a minute, stimulates the cells to form a new layer but they're also organized and orderly. That's called ductal hyperplasia. It's kind of like a freckle. Uh, it wasn't there before. It's not perfectly normal skin, but we're looking for melanoma here. So nobody cares. It's a sign of aging and exposures. But when that new layer starts to look what we call atypical, the cell is getting kind of out of shape, the nucleus is bigger and the cells are heaped up on each other, growing without control or order. It's just a matter of degree then between atypia and the first stage of breast cancer, stage zero, ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. So when those atypical cells heaping up on each other and filling in the duct start to get so crowded that the duct expands by two millimeters, that's when the pathologist calls it breast cancer. So 
DCIS is stage zero because by definition, those cancer cells, they're cancer, but they're stuck inside an intact duct. And without access then to breaking through, they can't get to lymphatics and bloodstream to spread and cause a true threat to your life. Now, if left undiagnosed or untreated, one third of DCIS eventually penetrates that duct wall right there inside your breast. That breakage of the duct is termed invasion. So when people are first told when they get a biopsy and then they get that fateful call that you have invasive breast cancer, their mind like unravels to the worst case scenario of invasive, it's all over me. It's in my liver and my lungs and my brain. And actually it hopefully isn't, but it just, that word invasive simply means that it invaded the duct wall right there in your breast where the biopsy happened. But now these cells do have potential access to lymphatics and bloodstream so they can spread to the armpit lymph nodes and beyond. Now, in terms of the staging of breast cancer, stage zero is when the cells are caught inside the duct, totally curable, chemo never needed. And then the earlier stages one and two have to do with the size of the cancer inside your breast. And as long as it didn't go to any nodes or up to three nodes, you're in that early stage. And then if the cancer gets over five centimeters and more nodes involved, stage three, and then stage four is when it's escaped to another organ like lung, liver, brain, or bone, which are the most common sites of metastases for breast cancer. Thank you for that. A plus. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Now, to ask this very clearly, why do our boobs like plants? Okay, our breasts, I have to be official when I say that word, love plants because of the nutrients that plants give every single breast cell. So you have to realize this first. Every single time you lift fork to mouth and you chew and swallow, whatever you are chewing and swallowing gets absorbed through your intestinal tract into your bloodstream and whatever chemicals are in that bloodstream flowing around end up saturating and bathing your cells. This is called a cellular microenvironment. So what is in that bathtub is always either screaming out pro-cancer or anti-cancer. And it's doing it specifically as it relates to breast cancer, but really all cancers, is by changing estrogen levels, growth hormones, particularly IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, the big daddy growth promoter of all the hormones that can be inside your body. It can increase or decrease angiogenesis, angio blood vessel, genesis, birth, the birth of blood flow. So every single cancer cell, breast and other, needs to create its own blood supply to itself if it wants to grow beyond the size of a tip of a ballpoint pen. And believe me, it wants to grow. So angiogenesis brings that cell the nutrients it needs to grow. And then imagine this, when it gets to an, its little adult size, exit strategy, straight out those same blood vessels, straight into your liver or lung or bone. Inflammation, free radical formation, immune system function, every time you chew and swallow. You're choosing to either promote cancer or kill cancer. And that's why food affects breasts. When you ask specifically about plants. So there are phytochemicals, plant-based chemicals that we generally call phytonutrients or just nutrients because no one wants to even think of kale as like releasing chemicals. But in point of fact, and this is important for my more scientifically minded people out there, that's what's so beautiful for a scientifically minded person coming to like the argument of plant-based or not, they will wrap their minds around the chemistry of it all and start to understand that truly on a molecular level, these plants are releasing chemicals that have effects on the downstream cellular function. So in less kind of fancy terms, you take turmeric, you've got curcumin, green tea, epigallocatechin-gallate, EGCG. You take red grapes, the skin, resveratrol. You take um, soy, genistein. So these molecular components become nutrients, which are literally bathing those cells, decreasing the estrogen that remember fuels 80% of all breast cancers, decreasing IGF-1, the big growth promoter, uh, which by the way, if you can't process IGF-1, you'll never get cancer. It's already been proven. There are people in Ecuador. They have something called Laren syndrome. They can't process IGF-1. They are all 
um, medical, they all have medical dwarfism because they can't grow. And no one in the history of the world with Laron syndrome has ever had breast cancer or type two diabetes, just sidebar. These same chemicals will decrease angiogenesis, stop that blood flow influx to the cancer cell, decrease inflammation, boost the effects of your immune system to be able to target out, seek and destroy cancer cells. Probably the most powerful of all phytochemicals or nutrients that has yet to be studied, I would have to award it to sulforaphane, which you're getting from your cruciferous vegetables. Of all the breast, the healthiest breast superfoods, I mean, I have a, about 14 of them and the, most of them are in my antioxidant smoothie, which if you don't know about it, Google it and drink it like most days of the week because it is so packed with antioxidant powers and it tastes delicious, people love it. Because the base is, uh, a cup and a half of soy milk and then two fistfuls of greens and then like two cups of berries, which are so powerful with their pro And um, then everything else you put in there, you can't really taste. So it's just deliciousness. And then you throw in the, the turmeric and the omelet and the green tea and you get it all in one drink, like you're superhuman for the day. Not literally. So, so forafane, um, is a big one and soy is a huge one. We can bust that myth if you want to and flax seeds. Those are my top three. Get them in you some way, somehow, every single day. Two tablespoons of ground flax seeds. Highest content of lignans of almost any plant food on the planet. Lignans are powerful anti-estrogens and anti, they have other anti-cancer properties. So, so much so that there are some great studies that we could go through, but they like, okay. So one of my favorites, because it's so simple to like wrap your mind around. A bunch of women had a biopsy of breast cancer and half of them are given a placebo muffin and half are given a flaxseed muffin. Okay, a muffin. We're talking vegan junk food. The flaxseed muffin had two tablespoons of ground flax seeds in it, that amount. They ate it every single day. And then five weeks later, they had their definitive breast cancer surgery. And so now we have two specimens before and after the muffin, their cancer biopsy, and then their cancer excised. Three main things were looked at under the microscope on these cancers before and after the flaxseed. One was the division rate proliferation. How many cells under the microscope right now are one becoming two? It's called the KI-67. Another one was C or B2 protein, a marker of aggression, like, you know, ugliness. Um, and the third one was apoptosis, which is a really fun way of explaining cancer cell suicide, which is like programmed cell death. Time for you to go and you know it and you kill yourself. So we've got the baseline numbers on the core and then they eat this muffin for five weeks. What happened? The proliferation rate, the division, went down 34% in the flaxseed group. The CRB2 expression went down 71%. And apoptosis, cancer cell suicide, went up 31%. Just from five weeks of eating flaxseeds, everything else in their diet was the same, everything. So that's the power of flax. And I've got a lot more data than that to that I could share. So those are my top three. And that is a somewhat long-winded explanation about why what you chew and swallow affects your breasts. All right. So apart from eating a whole foods plant-based diet, what else should we be doing for breast cancer prevention? So there are boulders that can sit on the scale of your life, pushing you toward breast cancer or away, toward any cancer and illness, in fact, or away. And if you have a boulder on your scale, I suggest you really start working on mm, chipping away at it and lifting it off so that you have a, your best fighting chance against this looming disease. So the boulders, we've hit one of them, is diet and nutrition. And it will weigh you down toward cancer if you're eating predominantly or a lot or maybe any animal protein and animal fat. And you will lift it higher if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet. Boulder number two obesity. I mentioned 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. And while this is totally not about fat shaming, which is always cruel and unkind and uncalled for, what overweight people need to know is that this whole movement sort of, of, of um, fat and fabulous it really is dangerous to your health and could kill you because so many disease processes are promoted by that excess weight that you're carrying. 
So I encourage everybody to just Google up uh, body mass index. We've got a calculator at pinklotus.com. You just BMI and find out if you're too chubby. And if you are, make a solid plan to lose that weight because the great news, I should tell you the bad news. The bad news is that if you are overweight or obese, you have 50 to 250% more breast cancer occurrence, recurrence, and death than you would if you were in your ideal body weight range. But the good news is that if you lose the weight, you lose the risk. So that's Boulder two. Boulder three, alcohol. Alcohol increases breast cancer because it increases estrogen levels. It is a carcinogen, acetaldehyde forms. Even if you just put it in your mouth and spit it out, you already make acetaldehyde and swallow it down. It impairs the immune system. But the main driver, it seems from studies, of why alcohol pushes toward breast and many other cancers is that it interferes with this enzyme that sounds like a really bad word, MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase is what it really stands for. And this enzyme takes folic acid from vitamins folate from your lovely leafy greens and turns it into methylfolate. This is the activated form that babysits DNA as it divides to make sure that it stays true to its original form. Oh, it mutated. Let me fix it or throw it out. Love yourself some methylfolate. But 30 to 50% of people just by birth already have a suboptimal MTHFR. Not enough usually if um, they're just eating normal amounts of fruits and vegetables that they would notice the impairment. But if you drink, then you really knock that enzyme out for the day. Now you don't have your DNA babysitter and cancer arises and it's undetected, unstopped and proliferates. Part of the nurse's health study too, looked at women over time and pulled out the subset of drinkers. So amongst women who drank one or more glasses of any kind of alcohol daily, those with the highest folate consumption, uh, amounting to 600 micrograms a day versus the lowest among drinkers, those consuming the folate had 89% less breast cancer. So that speaks to kind of front loading this enzyme's job with so much over here that it can churn out enough to babysit the DNA. So that's, um, that's the me those are the mechanisms by which alcohol contributes to breast cancer, but by how much? So a drink, a drink in America is five ounces of wine equals 12 ounces of beer equals 1.5 ounces of hard liquor. So get whichever poison in your mind that you want to. And here are the stats. As opposed to a non-drinker, a drink a day increases breast cancer by 10%, two drinks a day, 30%, three drinks a day, 40%, and onwards and upwards from there. So alcohol, boulder. Fourth boulder, exercise or the lack thereof. Exercise reduces estrogen levels, but it also uh, releases the, it just it ultimately builds up your immune system. And it also helps maintain body fat loss. So how much exercise is enough and which exercise is the best? If you wanna look at the National Institutes of Health and use them as the bar, which you should, you need to have five hours weekly of exercise where you're just kind of like sauntering and can chit chat with a friend or maybe even sip coffee. If you're gonna put pep in your step, moderate to vigorous exercise, you need two and a half hours a week. But if those numbers sound astoundingly high to you because you just think you're so super busy or you haven't exercised in, if you might be honest, a decade or more, and that sounds impossible, I'm gonna share a study, this will encourage you. 17,000 postmenopausal women were um, followed for 7.9 years. And those who simply just walked briskly for 11 minutes a day had 18% less breast cancer. Okay, you can walk briskly for 11 minutes a day. And if you can't, walk for however many you can and try to do more tomorrow. If you put some pep in your step, and some time into the week. Three to four hours a week of vigorous exercise drops breast cancer rates by 30 to 40%. Five plus hours, 57% drop. So the more, the better, but I'll take what you'll give me. Now, which exercise is best? Whichever one you'll do, I'll take anything. So those are our boulders. We've got diet and nutrition, alcohol, exercise, obesity. 
Next, we have pebbles. These are things that, yeah, they can tip a scale for sure. I'm not denying that. But if you've got a boulder on there, the pebble's not going to make low any lower. So these are hormone replacement therapy, environmental toxicities, and emotional stress. So there's a lot you can control beyond diet and nutrition. And I really love helping women navigate how to incorporate more lifestyle changes into their armamentarium to fight against an existing breast cancer, or maybe they're at elevated risk and already in tune to the disease and want to maximally reduce their risk. So in addition to diet, we talk about exercise, we talk about their weight and what to do if it, they're overweight and need to drop a few. We talk about alcohol, which by the way, is an aside, if you choose to drink, the American Cancer Society doesn't advocate that you start drinking, but it says keep it to no more than one drink a day for women, two drinks a day for men. And I will tell you um, that if you choose to drink, you might want to favor red wine because it has a couple of redemptive qualities, specifically resveratrol, which is an anti-proliferative, anti-neoplastic um, agent even looked at in trials right now to treat cancers. And it's an aromatase inhibitor. Fancy words again, um, aromatase, an enzyme. Everywhere you have a fat cell, you have aromatase. Aromatase takes precursor steroids from your adrenal gland, like testosterone and androstenedione, and turns it into estrogen. So that's an estrogen fuel source that red wine cuts out for the day, the aromatase inhibitor. Um, so we talk about drinking and we then move on to some of the pebbles and sleep is really important. Melatonin and its secretion gives your body that time to do cell rejuvenation and repair. It gives your immune system the breath of fresh air from digesting the meals that people eat like three to six times a day. It keeps your immune system a little diverted, but then now at night, you can really seek out and destroy and target some, some cancer cells because nothing else is uh, taking up its attention and time. Fasting, very powerful tool when it comes to allowing that cell rejuvenation and repair, the targeting of um, dysplastic or deranged crazy cells, i.e. cancer cells or just mutated cells. Fasting um, in one study, in 2015 showed a 36% drop in breast cancer recurrence for those who simply didn't eat for 13 consecutive hours daily. And the more, the better. So trying to fast 13 to 16 on a nightly basis is cancer protective, as is doing a more prolonged fast, like a five day fast, like a fasting mimicking diet if you can't go water only. There's a lot of data behind that. And daily prayer and meditation using an app if you need to, meditation, which to a lot of people just sounds too like, um, you know, 60s and uh, out there for them. I encourage them just to deep breathe, take one big deep inhale in for three seconds and exhale for six seconds and do that a few times and see if you don't already notice. You will stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system just by doing that, calming you down releasing the antithesis to those stress-inducing catecholamines like epinephrine. There's a lot of power behind meditation on a cellular level. It can decrease blood pressure and increase focus and attention. And it also gives your immune system that boost that it needs. So those are just a few ideas behind what you can do beyond nutrition to dramatically affect your breast cancer risks and outcomes. <sighs> Okay. So, <laughs> Did you just deep breathe? <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Okay. So diet and nutrition. Is diet and nutrition number one? You mentioned it first, and no doubt at Plant Based News, we love talking about plant based nutrition. Is it safe to say that diet and nutrition are number one on your list? I think it's the top thing you should focus on. I think it carries the a ton of impact. It's hard to measure. Um, um, and create, you know, crown somebody king of the risk reduction. But if I had to choose, I would pick that for a couple of reasons. One, it's immediate. It is immediate. Let me share this with you. When women come and tell me, oh, doc, come on, I'm 65. I look like this. I have cancer. I've never exercised. And it's too late for me. I always say, mm -mm, sister, never too late. Let me tell you about a study, 50 obese women 
their blood was checked for IGF-1 levels. We've talked about how that's the huge growth promoter and IGF-1 binding protein, kind of like this body snatcher that retires IGF-1 from circulation. Then they took their blood and dripped it onto a Petri dish blanketed with human breast cancer cells. Yeah, a few cells died because if you're alive, your immune system's probably doing something that could kill off a few cancer cells. So these women then go away with instructions to follow the Pritikin plan from Nathan Pritikin a low fat, high fiber, whole food plant-based diet and daily exercise. And by exercise, we're kind of talking about those ladies who saunter for 11 minutes a day, but they have to do it for 30 minutes a day. And they go away for 12 years, months, weeks, days. 12 days later, they come back, draw the blood, IGF-1 plummeted, binding protein skyrocketed, new Blood draw, new Petri dish filled with breast cancer cells, drop that blood on there and the majority of cancer cells die on the spot. In less than two weeks, these women have transformed their blood into a cancer kicking machine. Weight loss takes time. Building up the benefits of exercise takes time. Alcohol, you can stop immediately, um, but that the power of food, as evidenced by just that simple story of a study, um, is immediate. So if we want to start getting immediate anti-cancer power coursing through our veins, then I suggest we focus on the food. Mm -hmm.